probably we can start our uh, afternoon session. And the first two speakers, we have two speakers, uh, Bernard Beckerman and Matos from University of Lille, France. Uh, and the title of their talk is Solving the Signed Equilibrium Problem uh, on Several uh, Real Intervals. Please, uh, Professor Beckerman, will you, you, you will speak, you will start? Yes. I, I okay, speak. so yeah. please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I will report about uh, joint work with uh, Anna Matosh, who's also here from, for replying to the questions afterwards. And uh, uh, in fact, uh, like many of you, I'm, I'm very much regretting not to be in NFT. Uh, I would have been able to check out uh, how it was compared to 15 years ago, where we have been at the North Sea, not at the Black Sea. And we have been in the north of the France, but not in the south of Russia. But uh, many friends are at those meetings, and, and uh, it would be nice for me to be there too. Okay, so uh, quickly the outline will um, plot some integral equation related to equilibrium problem in 2D electrostatics. And uh, this turns out to be an integral equation with a logarithmic kernel. And uh, we will manipulate a little bit this equation to, to get to Cauchy kernel and uh, where we have the techniques of uh, riemann hilbert techniques. Um, and then we suggest to solve this problem by using some spectral methods, a polynomial spectral method, which uh, has been published before, but without error analysis, and rational spectral method, which is new, and provide some error analysis and numerical experiments. So here's the problem which we would like to solve. So we have a set I, which is a union of, of disjoint non-singleton uh, compact real intervals, uh, which we arrange uh, from the left to the right. And we have a function which is defined on I, which we call external field. We look for a measure which is not necessarily positive, so a side measure, mu, which has a, a total mass, um, sorry, support, supported in I and uh, total mass equal to one. And we look for some constants such that we have this equation here, say for all x and i, where the v mu, as usual, as we have seen today already, is the logarithmic potential of the measure. So in fact, this problem is much simpler than the usual extremal problem with external fields where we have positive measures to deal with. Here we have we allow for side measures. So what we suggest to do uh, is to follow many uh, authors on this field. This list is certainly in incomplete. Instead of uh, asking this equality, we will derive this, this identity here and ask that the derivative of this function on the left is equal to zero on each interval, which means in fact that the function itself is a constant, but depending on the interval. And in the second step, we have the normalization conditions, very few of them, that the mass is correct and that all the constants are the same. So this is the problem which we really want to tackle. What happens with the logarithmic potential if we take derivatives? Oh, sorry, before going there, uh, I should uh, mention, fix a little bit of notations. If I'm writing mu j, I'm speaking of the restriction of mu, j, mu on the interval ij. I'm considering omega j, which is the equilibrium measure of um, of the interval ij, and uh, I consider e equally eta j, which is a modification. Okay, and so the unknown functions in what follows will be the density of our unknown measure with respect to equilibrium measure on the each interval, which I call rho j. So rho j will be the unknown function in what follows. What we have to do is, in this new notations, we have our uh, logarithmic potential, the mu of x, and we have to take a derivative there. So what happens? Well, this is, of course, well known. Uh, if uh, x is very far from the integral, uh, from the interval where we integrate, uh, then you can exchange derivation with, uh, with integration, and uh, you get to what is called a Cauchy transform. Uh, but if you are on the support, of course, it's a little bit delicate to, 
to derive to take derivatives. Uh, so what you have to do, in fact, is uh, you have to regularize this integral, and in fact, uh, you should take the principal value integral uh, in order to get the derivative. So I will denote, in fact, uh, these two integrals by special names because they are known as the weighted Cauchy transform or weighted Hilbert transform of this function rho k, which appears here. Okay, so um, before going further, a little more information. The CK, the Cauchy transform, it, it's a very well-known operations, but uh, let me say a little bit on the Hilbert transform which is also well studied in the literature. Uh, it's not too difficult to show that it's a, a bijection between um, L2 of omega k uh, and L2 of eta k. This is why this new measure does occur. Um, if we want to go a little bit further, we suppose for a moment that we have normalized our interval i k by linear transformation, let's say. And in this case, uh, we know the action of this h k on Chebyshev polynomials the tk of first kind and uk of second kind and the action is here is written down here so you see in fact uh, uh, more information about this how this uh, uh, hk acts and, and this will be very useful in what follows because because of the principal value integral we would not like to use any any quadrature rule to evaluate this integral approximately uh, in contrast for the Cauchy transform, as long as x is far from, from the interval, we could imagine to use the integral of course. So if we just go back to our condition D. Effect, uh, the bar of, okay. If we go back to our, our formula D, in fact, this now takes the form, um, which just can be written down in terms of hk and ck. If we are in the interval ij, in fact, uh, we write the integral on m intervals as a sum of m integrals. And one of the integrals which we have will be a, the Hilbert transform and the other ones are quotient transforms. And we notice that uh, as long as we are in aj, uh, ij, uh, the term ck of rho k is a, is a smooth term. It's in fact analytic in the neighborhood of IJ, of course. Okay, so there is a theorem of uh, existence and uniqueness of the problem which we have uh, posed. In fact, uh, if we suppose that the derivative of the external field, the restriction on the IJ element uh, interval, is a, is a function in L2, sorry, the ordinary L here, L2 of eta J. Uh, for all j, then there is one and only one solution, uh, rho k in R2 of omega k, which uh, gives our equilibrium equations, which solves our transform problem. In fact, my talk is more or less finished because I can even give you the solution. The density with respect to the back measure has this, uh, this can be found in books on integral equations or, or even on work on river neighbor problems. Uh, can be written down as, as a sum of two terms. The second term uh, deals with the external field, but does not give the good normalization. And so we have a correction here, which uh, uh, is for external field zero. And uh, where the polynomial numerator here, the PM minus one is uh, a polynomial which has to be adapted to satisfy the M normalization conditions. So in fact, the work is done because I give you the extremal measure, but uh, the problem is that this formula is not as nice as we would like to have it. Uh, in fact, it's perfect for one interval. Let's have a look. Say, uh, let's take an interval of minus one, one. And we suppose that we have a Chebyshev expansion of our external field. So for one interval, the P just gives the one minus Z two, no? And one minus set two, uh, set two minus one, or one minus set two, you put it uh, with uh, uh, the new here in order to get density with respect to equilibrium measure, and you put it with a y in order to get the eta measure. Uh, so there is no longer this term, it's just this term. So if you have a t expansion of q, you have a u expansion of uh, q, q prime, and then there is here the adjoint of the Hilbert operator, which tells you that the solution is indeed 
such an isomer. In fact, you don't have to go through the um, through this formula. In fact, you can prove it directly by knowing the the uh, pot uh, potential matrix under there. So that so far so nice. In fact, here we have no done no numerical approximation. We have just written down the solution. Uh, but for two intervals, things become more complicated. And just to give you an idea, just to give you an idea, um, in fact, here we have essentially two intervals, the one over A I1 and the one over I2. And if we are in I1, which we're supposed to be like that, um, then there is, for instance, this integral to compute. And um, if you start off with a T expansion of Q, you have here a U expansion of Q prime, um, but uh, using the same trick as, as before, you still keep these square roots here. So uh, if we have a T expansion of the, this numerator, for instance, we can make out of that a U expansion. This one goes out of the integral and uh, um, we can use again the adjoint of the Hilbert transform in order to get explicit formulas in terms of this new Chebyshev development. So far, so nice. So again, we don't need any approximation or beside maybe truncating the Chebyshev expansion. Uh, but notice that the Chebyshev expansion of this function here is extremely slowly converging. Uh, um, if this interval A2, B2 is close to our interval I1. And since there is a singularity, that's square root singularity. And so, in fact, we either we have to deal with extremely long Chebyshev expansions, or, in fact, uh, uh, it's not so clear what to do, how to numerically evaluate this. And this is only the interval on I, the integral on I one. On I two, you have a similar integral where you would like to use quadrature formulas. And there uh, again, if the two intervals are close, in fact, the function is not regular enough to get a good rate of convergence. Here. So. Um, Again, um, in fact, this formula looks a little bit like the Christopher Schwarz uh, formula for numerical mapping of polygons. It's a beautiful formula, but for numerical evaluation, it's, it's, it's quite tricky because of the similarities and of the principal value interval. So we would like to go for another approach. And what we suggest here is a spectral method, a classical method for integral equations, in fact. Um, which requires several ingredients. So for each interval uh, IK, we need uh, some orthonormal basis in this space with respect to equilibrium measure. And we need another orthonormal basis with respect to this space. Um, we would like to use this beautiful property which I pointed out for Chebyshev polynomials, but maybe more in an abstract setting. And we also need that this uh, quantity here is explicitly computed. And what do we have to do? In fact, I'm going back to the formulation of the extremal problem with condition T here and condition normalized here. And we have to write this down in terms of this uh, expansion in this orthogonal functions. So we are looking for an expansion of each row K in this basis of the T. Uh, and we are plugging in. So here's the, the, the reformulation of T. In fact, all what I've done is to multiply uh, the preceding equation with um, uh, one U function and then using orthogonality in order to get simplification for the Hilbert term. And we keep the Cauchy terms here uh, with our unknowns and the right hand side here with our unknowns. Uh, with, with, without unknowns, sorry. Uh, for the reformulation of the normalization condition, it's a little bit more involved. I won't explain all details. For the total mass, it's easy because only the term T0 um, is a contribution for the total mass. And for the equilibrium constants, in fact, we use the measure of the condenser with plates uh, IJ minus one and IJ for J from, from two to M and for the mean is seven in order to get this formulation. So finally, what we end up with is a huge system of equations, in fact, infinite system of equations for the unknowns rho JL um, and if we want to compute the matrix of coefficients, um, we need to compute some integrals here. 
Okay, so that's what I wrote down, but I took a particular choice, uh, which was already promising from the preceding uh, slides. I'm taking championship polynomials, but they should be, of course, adapted to the interval IK here. So we shift them to, the, to this interval. Okay, first kind and second kind. So for them, we have all properties true, which I listed before, which I listed before. All these four properties are true, and so we can do that in that. I don't write it down again. I'm just saying that this gives an infinite, infinite dimensional system of linear equations. The identity comes from the fact, from the Hilbert transforms, the fact that we use the good basis. And uh, the uh, infinite matrix K can be seen to be a compact operator. And the, in fact, there are blocks which describe the interaction between the interval IJ and IK, or J different from K, or J equal to K, this matrix is zero. Um, so this is not doable on the computer. So what we are doing is to truncate. So instead of having infinite sum, we have a finite sum. So this is typically what the, the people do in spectrum method. So, and also we don't want to compute all the integrals in the, uh, in the coefficients, which I told you before. So we use uh, Gaussian quadrature formulas, which are well adapted to, uh, uh, to either T functions or U functions. So uh, you see here we have either Gaussian quadrature for the Chebyshev weight of the second kind or for the Chebyshev weight of the first kind here. And uh, um, this gives then a flat dimensional system, or here I've written it down with an infinite number of unknowns, but uh, K underscore only has zero entries from a certain way. So uh, the, the classic question in order to uh, go further is how to choose NK. And I want to give some indication. Um, NK is both the truncation index, but also the order of the quadrature formulas, which we will use. So in fact, uh, I have to report about some drawbacks in our method. Um, using the same uh, Riemann map uh, as we have seen in Riemann's talk, um, we can control and we can quantify, in fact, the error between the theoretical operator, let's say, and the practical operator, and also for the right-hand side, where we have also quadrature. Uh, and if we can control this, we can control this, but only provided that for a given tolerance, let's say multiplied by some constant, uh, explicit, but uh, I don't want to write it down here. The rate of convergence is essentially given by the uh, value of phi j uh, on the neighboring intervals, in fact, in the closest points of the neighboring intervals. If you have j equal to one, b0 means you have to take the other one and bm, and a m plus one means you have to take the one. So uh, in fact, what we learned from there is that met this method uh, converges with a very interesting rate in small nj's as long as the intervals are well separated. This is what we can learn from there. And this is also what we expected from our integral, which I showed you before, uh, because this is exactly related to the range of analyticity of the functions which we want to integrate, for instance, by a mapping parameter. So uh, this is something which we expected, like this, this rate of convergence. So this is one drawback for intervals which are close, to, if ij is close to, uh, the set, let's say the smallest convex set, which contains all the other intervals. Uh, there is another drawback, which I would like quickly to, to speak about, is that in fact, we can, we know much about integral equations. We know that the matrix K typically has a DK in its entries, but not only this, in fact, these blocks here have um, singular values, which are decaying very quickly. And this has been quantified, for instance, known before for the Cauchy kernel, but quantified in a more general setting uh, by uh, a paper jointly with uh, Alex Thompson, uh, where we were able to, to write down an explicit inequality for the decay of the nth singular value in terms of this uh, Solotarov quantity. Um, nobody mentioned Solotarov, which is about, <laughs> so far, which is about, uh, who is about as old as Shemiche, the student. Um, so um, the, the problem of solitarif is, the third problem in effect, 
is to find a rational function which is not big on E and its reciprocal, reciprocal function is not big on the second set, closed set of sets. And here we need it with the sets IJ and IK. So in fact, we should not solve the initial problem with a naive solver, which is enormous, but we have a very much a structure which is exploitable. The theory of hierarchical matrices does not help us uh, to, to construct this or fast multiple methods or something. But I would like to go back to this theorem because uh, the proof is constructive. It shows where how, how to find these um, singular vectors uh, corresponding to these singular values, which are serious. And it tells you that, in fact, rational functions should play a very important role. And this is why I would like to make a second attempt, the spectral method with rational functions. And here's probably the most horrible slide which I have prepared for you. Uh, in fact, I don't want you to understand all details, uh, just to the structure. So where does it come from, our new functions? In fact, they have a name. In fact, they have been invented by, by other people. There is what is called, so we fix ourselves some parameters, real parameters in the open interval minus one, one such that this series is divergent. And then this formula here, uh, this function is well known, it's called the takenaka Malmquist orthogonal rational function. And in fact, it forms, as long as you have this condition, it's a complete uh, orthog orthonormal system in the Hardy space H2. And if you take Faber transforms as did uh, Rimoj, uh, you're ending up with what is called Faber Bashian orthogonal functions. In fact, usually they are not orthogonal, but for the interval case, it turns out that not only there are nice rational functions, but they are also orthonormal to each other with respect to uh, measure omega j. And uh, if I modify a little bit this approach, the u functions, in fact, um, uh, you get orthonormal functions. You can prove that, and it's well known, orthonormal functions with respect to measure. So these are typical candidates which we could explore for our spectral method. They are rational functions, they are new and better adapted, as we will see, to handle the singularities and uh, small gaps. So I should just say, if you take uh, all wj equal to zero, you get here a power of w, and you recover up to normalization the classical formulas for Chebyshev polynomials of the first and the second kind. So this is a uh, somewhat interesting, and our idea is to fine tune these parameters omega j n in such a way that we can, it, it is sufficient to use the spectral methods of small size. And this is exactly what we have to do. And uh, so one essential ingredient to block diagonalize, if you want, was that the action of the Hibbert transform on the t function was now given, well, given by the U functions. And it turns out that this is also true for these rational functions. If you see them, you might not believe it, but uh, in fact, after some computation, you get it. We also have explicit formulas of uh, the, the Cauchy transform in terms of the conformal map of, of the interval IJ, which are very exploitable. Um, but there is no longer an obvious link between the uh, derivative of Tj, of Tn and so we have to take a little bit of care of that. And uh, what Bultil and many of his co-authors, in fact, Bultil is probably one of the special worldwide specialists on orthogonal rational functions. And what I show you is, in fact, orthogonal rational functions to a given Chebyshev weight. And he had papers on that and explained that there are rational quadratures. And rational quadratures, uh, the, the weights and the nodes can be uh, computed by considering two you know, not Jacobi matrices, but uh, to diagonal pencils. Okay, and here's the main message. There exists a very explicit CJ, just the formula is a little bit complicated, so I don't show it. Uh, in such a way that if you want to have tolerance, uh, given tolerance, you just have to choose the NJ by this formula um, in order to achieve a certain tolerance. Uh, may, but this is not true, of course, for arbitrary choice of our parameters. In fact, we have to choose the poles of our rational functions in a way, in this interval, in a way that uh, they are optimal poles in the extremal solar tariff problem 
post on these two intervals, so the IJ, and this was the convex hull uh, on the other intervals. Okay, so uh, it turns out, and uh, this brings me closer to the end of my talk, um, that uh, if you use these new functions, in fact, in, in case of gaps, which are not tiny, but uh, just small, 10 to the minus three here, uh, instead of getting very large systems, we get uh, quite reasonable systems and a uh, prescribed decision of Gauss and Mora. Uh, I don't formulate the theorems because they are taken out here. So just to give you a, a picture for the same configuration here, the same two intervals, I'm using external field, uh, which is analytic and uh, uh, high tolerance. And I see, well, I don't see much because the gap is very small, but uh, I will show you without gap, the comparison. And you see, in fact, that the extreme solution is not the same at all. And we can infer, we can check out the normal locality error, for instance, for the Kinnearing condition. Uh, indeed, the, the, the error is very small. Okay, and we see here the equilibrium condition graphically looks like a straight line, as it should. And here I'm drawing the measure with respect to like a Lebesgue measure, equilibrium with respect to a measure. So that lets me conclude my talk. I show, we showed you um, an error analysis for a polynomial spectrum method, which was suggested 10 years ago by Oliver without error analysis. And uh, we showed some essential improvements, especially if gaps are small, for, uh, through a new rational spectral method. We haven't seen so much before rational spectral methods, and we were excited about that this exists also. Um, and uh, we get, at least for smooth Q, I didn't speak so much about the smoothness, let's say uh, analytic in the neighborhood of each interval, uh, we get a much better rate with this new spectral method. And uh, this allows us to deduce uh, a check fund implementation for iterative balayage, for instance. Check fund is uh, a new concept of replacing functions in MATLAB by uh, championship series. Say. And uh, in fact, what we would like to do is to do this not only on intervals, but on curves or arcs. And we would like to understand recent work of Nick Drefton on numerical conformal maps. Uh, which seems to be quite exciting and with extremely high precision. So there seems to be some link. Okay, so I have one more minute left, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you have three minutes. Okay, so um, I just wanted to show you a picture of, of uh, iterated balayage for those who know, in fact. So iterated balayage you consists of- It's left for questions, if you don't- Okay, good, no problem. No question. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you very much. And now the questions uh, to the speaker, please. Yes. Could you say um, in what cases this uh, solution is really sign measure and in what cases it's positive measure? This one. Uh, in fact, the spectral method does not ask for positivity, so that would be by luck. But you, but the, who or not? I'm sorry? No, you, it doesn't give, in general, positive so, uh, solutions. No, you, in general, it gives only signed solutions. It is positive. The, the step from um, solving the signed equilibrium problem to the positive equilibrium problem, for instance, can be done through this iterated balayage, which I, which I didn't explain very well. Uh -huh. Roughly speaking, you balayage the negative part on the positive part for each at each iteration, uh, and the new uh, and this can be implemented by our chap fund uh, solution of the of an equilibrium um, problem side equilibrium problem on the support of the positive part, and which I've done here on the picture. Okay, and you see you. that in fact, if you iterate this several times. Thank you, and there is one more question. Mm -hmm. Just short. Uh, uh, could you precise uh, initials for the references? Suetin is the father? Or... Yeah, Suetin was the father, yes. Father. And Oliver is a, uh, is, a, is a young Oliver, yes? I'm sorry? Oliver, Oliver is a young Oliver, yes? Yes. The... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We have a question from uh, online question. Please. 
Yes, Peter Dragner, very nice talk. Thanks so much, Bernd. Uh, David Banco and I have also this thing called ping pong balayage. Yes. Uh, do you think that might be, uh, you know, good here where you solve on the uh, envelope of all these intervals and then you start balayaging out uh, the piece that you don't want to have measured? Yes. So the complement of two intervals, so then from the complement of the entire thing onto back this. And you do this ping pong kind of type. And then uh, in the limit, you end up with the solution on the intervals. Yes. Uh, it's very interesting work which you have done there. Um, I thought a lot about it, but uh, for me, the big thing about this work is that you can control the decrease of mass, negative mass impact. So you, you, you can monitor that the thing converges because uh, this is still open for iterative behavior, as you know. Uh, but the bad thing is that you're sending the negative mass to places where you don't want to have it. So I think numerically it's, it's uh, easier to implement, I agree but uh, uh, it, it will not converge as quickly. And, and therefore we are still looking for iterative balayage, maybe for some improvements that we can send each, at each iterate at a smaller set than only the support of the positive part. But uh, uh, in fact, I think that ping pong uh, takes many iterations to converge, though you have the control on the negative mass. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you. Un unfortunately, we have no time for extra questions because uh, it's already the time for the next talk. Sure. Thank you very much, Professor Bernard, the Professor Thank you, thank you everybody. <laughs>